It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Jack Norris. He's a 20-year vegan, a registered dietitian. Thank you, everyone, for coming on this inauguration eve, and I'm um, going to warm you up for Barack Obama's speech tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, I want to thank Stuart Solomon for organizing the talk and our mighty mate for organizing the talk. It was a really huge help, so thank you guys very much for this, for doing it. Okay, so my talk is about um, does veganism spread itself, the history of the animal rights and, and vegan movement in the United States, and it's going to have a strong focus on vegan outreach, as you will soon find out. Um, and it's also through my eyes, so I realize that there may be a little bit of bias here, but um, I, I think sometimes uh, people who especially have gotten involved in just the last few years uh, don't know the history of what we've, we've done. In fact, um, people are always writing us with advice that has been tried over and over and over again over the past 20 to 30 years. And so I know that a lot of people don't, don't know what's been tried and hopefully you'll find it, it interesting to see how um, vegan outreach uh, in, in the uh, small capitals has been done. So we've probably all heard I think someone tell us that we'll never get everyone to go vegetarian. Have, have many of you heard that? Yes. Okay. So the question is, um, in the United States anyway, how long and in what ways have we been trying to get everyone to go vegetarian? Uh, we shouldn't make that assessment until we at least try to do it for a while. So in the 1960s, the American Vegan Society was founded, and this was, about, this was the first uh, organized group promoting veganism in the United States. And they promoted it based on the principle of ahimsa, or in other words, non-harm. And they did it by way of lectures, books, newsletters, and tabling at festivals, particularly, particularly, particularly in their area of New Jersey, which is where they're located. And they did not use uh, graphic pictures of animals. And I just want to point that out that, uh, for later reference. Not as a criticism, but simply to say that they did not use graphic pictures. Okay, in the 1970s there was a number of vegetarian groups and they, they um, went along a similar lines and, and they promoted vegetarianism with a strong emphasis on being vegan uh, for health and the environment. They didn't use graphic pictures in their literature either. They did it mostly at festivals and they, they focused on older crowds, at least not non-student crowds anyway, not high school students or college age student people. Um, and <clears throat> I think that there was probably good reasons why they, they felt like they shouldn't use graphic pictures. They thought that that would be a turnoff to their audience and, and no one would listen to them. So I, I, I'm guessing that that's one of the reasons they didn't use them. Uh, in 1975, <coughs> Peter Singer published Animal Liberation, uh, which was the beginning, kind of marked the beginning of the United, United States animal rights movement. He gave a concise argument as to why speciesism was similar to uh, sexism and racism. In 1980, Jim Mason and Peter Singer together published a book called Animal Factories. Jim Mason had toured the country in uh, investigating factory farming. He had grown up in a farming community in uh, like the 19, early 60s, I think, 1950s maybe, and he saw how farming had changed over a few decades and wanted to investigate. So he went around and interviewed farmers, took pictures. At the time, they were very open to talking to him because it wasn't a concerted effort to, to end factory farming. And then they published this book. And this was really the first, uh, first thing that really detailed how, what was being done to farm animals in the United States. In 1981, PETA was founded. And just quickly, uh, they did a lot to bring animal rights into the, the minds of, of the average person. But it would be over 20 years before they actually had a comprehensive full-color brochure about factory farming and going vegetarian. In, eight, in 1981, also, the Farm Animal Reform Movement was founded, and their pamphlets actually did have depict images of animals and how they were raised, but they used drawings so that it wouldn't be too gory and in people's faces. In 1984, Student Action Corps for Animals, which was a group formed mainly to give support to students uh, who did not want to do dissection, they put out um, a, a group, a couple of uh, punk bands, did a 45 record for them, and they put out a, 
uh, record cover that opened up into kind of a pamphlet talking about the um, vegan lifestyle and it was black and white but it did contain graphic photos and I at the time um, it was the only thing I knew of that had graphic photos and I still don't know of anything that that did and here's like the front of the it's kind of warm now but uh, this is the inside. If you can kind of see, there's some. There's a slaughterhouse picture here. It's kind of tough to see at this resolution, but in any case, they had a, a so it was kind of a pamphlet, even though it came with a jacket cover, and it was very good. I thought it was very effective. Uh, I gave a lot out to high school students, and they seemed very interested in, in those pamphlets. Excuse me. Um, in the 1980s, also. There were many animal liberation front actions in the United States. There was a lot of civil disobedience against vivisection and fur. Uh, fur sales plummeted towards the end of that decade. At the time, there were, it was when the fur anti-fur movement really had gained a lot of momentum, and those of us who were involved felt that we had, were really making inroads and because the fur sales had plummeted. But a lot of it, it turned out to be due to warm winters, unfortunately, for progress. Um, it was good, at least for those few winners that uh, they didn't sell many. But uh, many companies ended their product testing there in the 1980s. PETA and uh, Henry Spira, who was an activist it, with Animal Rights International, had some campaigns that convinced Avon and Revlon and a number of other companies to stop doing testing on animals. A number of national magazines, including Newsweek and Time, did big exposés on the animal rights movement in, in <clears throat> about 1989 and 90. So things with the animal rights movement seemed to be gaining a lot of momentum towards the end of the, the decade, and then it, things started gaining momentum for, for farmed animals as well, because in 1988, John Robbins published Diet for New America. And I'm sure most of you know John Robbins. Uh, he was supposed to be uh, inherit the Baskin Robbins fortune, and he decided he thought that, uh, that ice cream was bad for everyone and uh, the environment and animals and, and he forewent that fortune and he wrote this book arguing that animal products harm the animals human health and the environment and because of this book that became very popular um, activists took on what became known as the three-pronged approach to promoting vegetarianism and that became basically the standard way that vegetarianism was promoted for the next 10 years in 1990, uh, there hadn't been an Earth Day celebration since 1970, and they resurrected the Earth Day celebrations, and it caused a big buzz. I remember that spring, the Earth Day celebrations all over the country, and everyone was really excited about doing stuff for the environment, and, and animal rights was kind of a sub-part of that. And <clears throat> so, again, momentum was being created, and then we had our first March for Animals in Washington, D.C. that year, that 17,000 people have attended. Okay. Now, I just want to touch uh, quickly on my personal activism during that time for some little background. I was living in Cincinnati, and we were doing dozens of fur protests outside of symphonies and plays, which is where a lot of people were wearing fur. We felt like a lot of the, the model at the time was kind of to protest fur the day after Thanksgiving, which is the biggest shopping day, and so it has become Fur Free Friday. and then maybe protested two or three other times over the winter. And we decided that just wasn't enough to get in, in people's heads about it, to have a protest once in a while. So we decided we were just going to go to every symphony and every play in Cincinnati that they had and, and leaflet out front of it. And at the, I met Matt Ball, who um, later founded Vegan Outreach with me. He was a student at the University of Cincinnati. And, the, and it, once again, the protests were growing. There, I went to a, pro, a Fur Free Friday protest in Chicago that had 600 people at it. And that, uh, one of those years, 1,000 people protested in New York City. Here's just a quick picture of what we were, we were uh, protesting fur. We had, please make this year fur free and we give out literature. <clears throat> Some very angry people <laughs> we ran into doing that. They were not happy. Uh, okay. Then, in 1991, after all this momentum had built, the Gulf War began in January, and animal activism really dwindled. It just basically killed it. And it turned out that a lot of these protests that we thought were getting bigger and bigger, we thought, all right, this year in Chicago, we have 600 people. Next year, it's going to be 2,000. And eventually, it's going to be you know, massive amounts of people on the streets. Um, and in addition to the protesters not really coming out anymore, the media really lost interest in animal rights. So that 
gave us time, Matt and I anyway, who we were very frustrated about the whole thing, gave us time to reconsider the paradigm that lasting change can be accomplished through large media events. Now, if they had kept growing and growing, um, there might have been a chance of that, but we decided that we really needed to turn to spreading vegetarianism because it was something that every individual could do on their own to help animals. Um, but we needed a tool, and uh, until that time, uh, the Student Action Corps for Animals were out of their jacket covers. No one else had a color brochure that was, had graphic photos, and we felt like this was really the thing that would get pe people to change their opinions. And so we, unfortunately, it's too bad, the, the lighting is causing that to look worse than it really does in most of the talks, but we, if we turn the lights off, there's no way to dim the front lights or anything, so we're stuck, sorry. Uh, anyway, there's a picture of a pig in the slaughterhouse, a cow in the slaughterhouse there. And uh, this was basically, to my knowledge, the first color, full color brochure promoting vegetarianism in the United States. It was just one sheet of paper, front and back. And we printed up uh, 10,000 copies. Uh, uh, and it took us, I think, a couple of years to distribute them all, which is really funny when we look back on it, because sometimes we distribute 10,000 copies in a day of our brochures now. But that's uh, how it was going. We distributed, the, we distributed them, them from tables, but we never really, never really occurred to us to go leaflet a college campus. Okay, in 1993, we uh, were really fed up with the fact that we felt like we were trying to get people to go vegetarian, and, and they weren't doing it for the most part. I mean, we, we at the time, you know, we were young for one thing. And we thought as soon as everyone knows what's going on, what's being done to animals, they're gonna want to join us in being vegetarian. And um, it was frustrating to see how many people didn't. Of course, some did, but we decided to do a three-day fast for farm animals outside of a slaughterhouse in Cincinnati. And so we did that, and we got some media attention, but we had a Stop Eating Animals banner. And during part of the fast, we walked over to the university district, and we just held a banner uh, for people to see. And we found that that was actually, the, the couple hours that we spent doing that, that was actually the most productive part of the entire fast because the, the students there seemed really interested in what we were doing and they came over and asked us questions and um, so that kind of put it in our heads that we need, this, we need to be reaching college students and not uh, trying so much to focus on the population at large and then Matt and I decided to start an organization together and we called it Animal Liberation Action and our main project was at the time was holding these Stop Eating Animals banners and we, picked, we basically picked the busiest intersections we could find. And we would stand out and hold them. And it, it was uh, very tough work. And it was hard to get other people involved um, to do it. Because uh, just standing there holding a banner for hours on end is, is very tiring. So that was our first project and attempt to get uh, people to change. It was very interesting the responses we would get, though. We, people, either, either they had no idea what we were talking about. They'd pull up and they'd say, are people are eating animals? Um, and we would, which would just make us even matter. Just like, what do you mean? You know, of course, and, and it turned out that they thought we were talking about dogs and cats. And we were fine. And then we got that a lot. We got that a lot. It wasn't just once or twice. And people would throw stuff at us. We had tennis balls, water, beer, uh, steak. Someone threw a steak at us one time. And someone threw a steak at us one time and landed on the ground. A person on a bike came riding up, stopped, got off the bike, said, oh, this is a perfectly good steak, and took it home. <laughs> yeah. It's probably the most interesting thing that happened while we did that. Um, okay, so and I'm going to now uh, talk more about what was going on in the rest of the movement and during that time, during the mid-90s especially. In 1994, uh, a magazine called No Compromise was founded, and I think it's still going on. I know it was just recently. And it renewed its interest. Uh, it, it caused a renewed interest in, in direct action, which was civil disobedience and vandalism, basically illegal things that uh, were, would be done to help animals in some way. And it was especially, you know, a lot of younger activists got into this. Um, it expanded through about 1996, got really popular, and then it kind of waned by 2000. The courts became less tolerant. For a while, the theory was. Uh, you could do civil disobedience for animal rights because if you got arrested, the company that you were protesting would not want to take you to trial because of the media interest and they didn't want to expose what they were doing. So you, you get a ticket basically and then get let go. 
uh, and then charges would be dropped. But it turned out that um, courts started to, to kind of crack down on it, and uh, they became less tolerant. So I, and it, I think it also waned because I think some of the activists didn't feel it was as effective as originally hoped. You know, it's very hard to vandalize the meat industry out of existence. They're just too big. There's too much money going on. Uh, they have insurance. I mean, it, it increases the insurance cost possibly, but not enough to suddenly put them out of business. Um, many strong proponents went into other areas of animal rights, like legislation and humane education in particular. Some of those, the people that were in the direct action, went on to do the first U.S. Open Rescues, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And um, others stuck with direct action and became involved in, in the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty Campaign, the Shack Campaign, which until recently I think was still pretty active and they might still be. I haven't heard anything from them in about maybe a few months to a year. A few of them had to go to jail, unfortunately, um, for putting private residences on a website and they got in trouble for that. Uh, <clears throat> 1994 to 95, we changed our name from Animal Liberation Action to Vegan Outreach because we decided we just wanted to really focus on spreading veganism. And we developed another a booklet this time called Injustice for All. And we started leafleting rather than holding banners. Because of so many people didn't know what we were talking about, we decided we really need to give people something. We can't just stand there with banners. Uh, even though we, we, so many people would see the banners, so many more people. So this was our first booklet, um, just basic. In 1995, we put a, another version of it out. Um, let's see here. Okay, so during the 90s, uh, we kind of felt like veganism took on a life of its own. And what, what I mean by that is that vegan gatherings amounted to basically talking about which products are vegan and which aren't. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that, that seemed to be mainly what was talked about. And vegans were taking a lot of pride in announcing they had discovered how yet another food or product wasn't vegan. And we kind of felt like we were, um, as a movement, maybe marginalizing our ourselves a bit by, by, by limiting a lot of our activities to these two things. Um, other, of course, was activism going on, but we felt like the majority of vegan activism was figuring out stuff about products. Um, there was a lack of awareness by the public that veganism was a serious social issue. And we felt like some of what we were doing in regards to being very focused on the ingredients and products was lending itself to uh, people feeling like veganism was just kind of this silly thing. And this would be highlighted by, the, by any time I would meet someone and tell them I was vegan. I would, well, I would often get a response like, oh my god, you need to meet so and so, they are totally into that. Where, and I, and it, which would anger me a bit because, I mean, some people probably were like, oh great, I do need to meet them. But I, I felt like that was like telling someone, if you found out that they were working on um, racial issues, that they, it, that, oh, you need to meet so-and-so because they're against uh, racism. And, which I think would be a, a, a rude thing to say for one thing, but, but it wouldn't be, because everyone should be working on it, everyone should care. So I felt like the people just didn't see. They saw us as a quirky group of people that didn't want to touch animal products for some reason that they didn't quite understand. So in 1996, we published an essay that we were very nervous about at the time um, called On Being Vegan. We published this in our newsletter. And um, debate, so this kind of sums up what it said, that Obvious animal products should be avoided, but a person's energy and efforts may very well be better spent trying to get others to stop eating burgers than in trying to avoid sugar bleach with bone char or trying to figure out if the monoglycerides in the cafeteria's bread comes from animals or plants. And to summarize some of the other things that we, other points we made, we said that a half hour of leafleting will likely reduce more suffering than going from 99 to 99.9% .9 vegan for someone's entire lifetime. And that is because you really, it's really impossible to be 100% vegan. And so you're not going to get there. But the effort to go from 99.0 to 99.9 to .9 .9 is a big effort. And it could be better spent helping animals in a different way, in our opinion anyway. And we want a vegan world, not a vegan club. Being vegan isn't about how many things can we find that aren't vegan so that we can make our group of people littler and smaller and smaller as we weed out the people who don't follow everything that we believe. Um, 
we wanted instead to marginalize ourselves as little as possible. Of course, we have to marginalize ourselves, marginalize ourselves a bit because of what we believe in, but we want as many people to join us as possible. Um, in 95 and 97, uh, we decided that, it, that college students were really the group of people to go after, and I traveled to 248 colleges handing out our Y vegan at the time. Uh, and I, we, I, along with people who would meet me in different locations, we handed out booklets to about 75,000 students. Uh, here's what the booklets looked at the time. This was our 96 version. We, uh, we were still designing it ourselves. On a, we had a Quark Express program at the time. Okay. My post-touring conclusions was that many students were interested in preventing animal suffering. I got a great response when I leafleted. Most of these people had never gotten you know, they had no idea about what was, what was going on at the time. Um, they had never even heard of animal rights in many cases. And I knew that we weren't reaching most of them. And I found also that many people had tried to be vegetarian uh, and had gone back often because they felt unhealthy. I might, I might have run into like someone once or every, uh, <coughs> excuse me, once for every school or maybe once for every other school while I was on the road, which became very frustrating. I would talk to them about it. And some of them, I think, is just an excuse. You know, they tried being vegetarian for a day and was like, oh, that, uh, I didn't like that. Um, I didn't feel great. But other people, I felt like, really had tried. Because I'd say, well, what about this? What about that? Why didn't you do this? And they, they'd explain it to me in detail. And, and so um, I eventually became a registered dietitian so that I could better understand nutrition because I, I just felt like I ran into a wall uh, with that. And I thought, you know, if we're going to be promoting this to everyone, we need to know, someone needs to know how to help these people or figure out what's going on. Okay, in 1998, oh, well, I didn't really say anything about the response on being vegan, and I don't think that we really got much of one. Um, but I th we, we did get um, one of our longtime supporters involved because of that essay, which was good. But, you know, we didn't, didn't hear a lot. But this essay caused a lot of response. We, in 98, we put out this called Veganism as a Path to Animal Liberation. And we, it was kind of a, basically trying to say that the model that we're using that Matt and I had felt for a number of years wasn't going to be effective, but that everyone, for the most part, all the activists were still using. We felt like we wanted to say to everyone, hey, look at what, what we're doing, and is this really the most effective way to use our time? And so here's a couple things that summarize it. Now that the general public is familiar with the idea of animal rights, our efforts for education, compassion, and justice have moved beyond the point where anger, slogans, and sound bites serve any further constructive purpose. It could be argued that the animals won't be further helped by hatred and chanting. Uh, we also pointed out in the essay that about 99% of all the animals killed in the USA were killed for food, yet a very tiny percentage of our movement's attention was going to those animals. And until veganism is more widespread, animal liberation can't succeed on any major front. And I still believe that today, and I still see it today. I was in the Sacramento, legis I was at a legislative hearing a few months ago and about kangaroo skins, and um, I didn't, it would take a while to explain why exactly. But we were there basically. They were debating whether to make it legal to import kangaroo skins into California, and one of the legislators said he had seen the footage of what they do to baby kangaroos and the adult kangaroos, but especially they. When they, if an adult has a baby joey, when they kill it, then they take the baby joey out and you know, smash it on the ground or something like that. So the, the legislator said, you know, that was really horrible, and I think it's terrible what they do, and I'm completely against it. But I can't vote to, to stop people from buying kangaroos because I eat meat. And, um, and, he, and so that just, to me, summarized the whole the attitude that, that we have to create enough people that, that don't fall back on that attitude before we make inroads with the other issues. And not inroads, but major inroads in the other issues. Okay, so the impact of that essay was, some people loved it. I wish I could concisely tell you how profoundly changed I am by veganism as a path to animal liberation. Other people asked us to take, us, take them off your mailing list. Um, so, <clears throat> but it did, I think the, one of the biggest benefits of it was it helped persuade Groups like PETA, especially, to spend more money on vegetarian outreach. Um, in 1998, Why Vegan? And I didn't really say much about, this is Why Vegan. It was the first book, you know, it was basically our first major booklet. And for many years it was, um, for the most part, our only booklet. Now we have a number of them. 
But it took a turn for the purple, and we got a real graphic designer to actually design it, and it's funny. Uh, at the time, we thought that was very state-of-the-art <laughs> design. <laughs> okay, got even more purple in 2000, and I put the two exclamation points here, if you can see them, because I feel like this was really, um, even though now it looks strange to me to see it looking like that, uh, I think this was the first time there was an effective brochure for handing to someone to get them to go vegetarianism, to go vegetarian or vegan. And I don't mean that other ones didn't work, because they all worked to some extent, but I felt like, oh, if I could have just had this while I had gone on my tour for two years, it would have been so much more effective. Um, so basically, it took the animal rights movement uh, about 19 years, in my opinion, to come up with something, a concise, very persuasive booklet that could at least reach the low-hanging fruit, the people who are going to be persuaded by by that, uh, and who, who don't have any idea what's being done to animals and are shocked and, and, and really want to do something about it when they first see it. So in 2000, um, the first USA Open Rescues were conducted in Compassionate Action for Animals, a group in Minneapolis, and Compassionate Over Killing, a group in Maryland, performed the first Open Rescues. Uh, there And a number of other groups uh, did some of those during especially the early part of this decade. It, the tactic has dwindled a bit now, and I think uh, it's because the media has shown less interest. At first, it was great to get a lot of media to rescue. Now, what an open rescue is, I'm sorry, is that you go in, you take animals from a factory farm, generally, and then you, tell, you contact the media and you tell them, we took these animals, if you want to arrest us, come and get us. So, for a long time, no one would come and get you, and the reporters loved it, because they, they would actually go with them to the thing to, and film them doing it. Um, or sometimes they just sent, they filmed themselves and sent video. But the media was very much into it, and so lots of big stories were done. Now, re most recently, someone had to do jail time for doing an open rescue. I think it was only about two months. Uh, Kat, do you know? Anyway. Um, yeah, I think it was just a few about, months. It was just a few months, but it has, so, so now, if you're going to do that, you kind of have to think, all right, I may have to be in jail for two months or maybe more if I do this, and which makes it less... Um, Enticing. Also during the early O's, PETA uh, started working to get welfare reforms among some of the big fast food restaurants. McDonald's ordered their egg suppliers to provide 50% more space to the hens due to a PETA campaign. And other groups worked on, on these as well to some extent, I think. Um, a lot of local grassroots organizations helped with them. And then they got Burger King and Wendy's to follow. In 2003, Viva USA persuaded Whole Foods Market to drop factory farm duck, and the CEO of Whole Foods became vegan in the process of discussing this with Viva. Um, and they began to develop animal welfare standards. And they are still in the process of putting out the full, uh, implementing their full set of animal welfare standards. And it's kind of amazing to think that before 2003, assuming that Whole Foods was probably the biggest uh, marketer of you know organic meat before that it was basically a, it was just kind of a factory farm except they weren't giving pest uh, they weren't feeding the animals hormones or injecting them with hormones or pet, putting pesticides in their feed so that but they were basically being factory farms so anyone who thought they were eating organic meat at that time was probably eating factory farm animals now that's not true in every case but it was a lot and so, another, another tactic that some groups have done is they, if they, they have done commercials showing farm animal abuse, especially on MTV channels, and Mercy for Animals has done that, Convention for Killing has done it, East Bay Animal Advocates, uh, and, it's, and probably other groups have as well, and especially been on local, like they do it for a small section, it's not MTV across the entire country, unfortunately that's very expensive. 2005, the Humane Society of the United States hired four Compassionate Over Killing employees into their farm animal department. This was kind of a big deal because for many, many years, HSU has really stayed away from promoting farm animal, uh, for doing anything serious for farm animals. And uh, the COK employees started a campaign to get food services and grocery stores to replace battery cage eggs with cage-free eggs. Uh, another tactic is that voter initiatives started up. In 2002, gestation crates were banned in Florida. 2006, gestation crates were banned in Arizona. 2008, 
veal crates, gestation crates, and battery cages were banned in California, uh, largely due to a lot of the efforts of a lot of people in this room. Uh, and they will be banned by the year 2015. That's the way the legislation was written. So that has been an effective way to uh, do a number of things. One is get those laws passed and hopefully get some of those animals out of these cages. In some cases, the farms move to a different state. But it also gets the awareness of farm animal issues into the public mind by doing these good initiatives. Now, because some of these welfare, like, okay, what I want to say is, when I first got involved in animal rights in about 1988 and 89, there was a big anti-animal welfare group movement. One, there was a lot of people really angry at how big, how much the salaries were that the people working for these groups were getting. A lot of them were earning, at the time, $80,000 to $200,000 a year. Um, and so there was that anger, and there was another anger that they weren't doing anything. They were not helping animals. They were just collecting money, for the most part. And so a lot of, uh, there became this very anti-animal welfare group part of the animal rights movement. And, um, but there's also a debate about whether it's even right to believe in animal welfare versus to just, you should just think that animals are not for humans to use. And that was what Peter's saying was, and probably still is, but that was a big saying, was animals are not ours to eat, wear or experiment on that you saw all of, anytime you saw Peter doing stuff, they would use that slogan. So um, anyway, this latest successes in animal welfare for farm animals especially, has ignited a debate which circulates every five to ten years in the movement, and that is whether it is uh, whether we sh whether we okay. Well, <laughs> sorry. We, there's basically three types of animal advocates. One is one are welfareists who believe it is okay to kill and use animals as long as it's done humanely. Um, then there are abolitionists, and there's two types of abolitionists. One type is in favor of pursuing animal welfare reforms while working towards the, the abolition of using or killing animals. And then there are those who are opposed to pursuing welfare reforms. So why are the people who oppose welfare reforms, why do they do that? Um, this, I, I have not wanted them, but I'm going to do justice to their arguments as much as I can. They feel like it is a waste of time and energy uh, because the, the reforms are not enforced. And they, some argue that they don't reduce suffering. Like some people argue that a uh, chicken in a battery cage is no worse off than a chicken who's outside of the cage but still on a factory farm laying eggs. Um, and then another argument is that it makes it easier for people to use animals. We've, we will soon be facing that issue in California when we leaflet because now people feel like we passed Proposition 2, everything is fine for farm animals now. So when we say well, you should go vegetarian, they're going to respond with, well, we passed that law, and that, so there's no reason for me to. And that is a drawback to some extent. Okay, so my opinion of this is that while pursuing a vegan world, resources are available for reforms that could, could reduce suffering. Basically, the Humane Society, I don't think it's realistic to expect that they're going to embark on a vegan advocacy campaign. They're going to put all their money into vegan advocacy. For one thing, there's a, a lot of people would not donate money to the Humane Society if that's what they did. So there is there are funds out there that people are willing to give, but they're not willing to give it to animal ad, to veganism, put, pursuing it. So we can use those funds to try to reduce suffering. Um, I, I and another thing, another reason I I, I think it's just a, a practical reason is that um, these groups are going to do this. And it's just going to happen, and no one's going to stop them from doing it. So we should just, if you're someone who doesn't like that they do that, you should think, in my opinion, you should think, given that there are going to be groups pursuing welfare reforms, how, what can I do to um, bring about abolition, knowing that that's going to happen? But to take that attitude of, I'm against this, what I'm going to do is fight those groups that do it, that's, I think, that's not going to uh, do much. And I've seen many an activist who worked on reforms for animals, then they, they become aware of this abolition argument, and then after that, they basically, they drop out of activism and they don't do much more than blog about why people shouldn't be doing welfare reforms. And so, which I don't think does much good for animals. So anyway, that's kind of my opinion. And um, so a, a great article on this if anyone is interested, I really recommend this article, and I'll read out the, the Earl. 
It's called a Strategic Analysis of Animal Welfare Legislation by Patrice Jones. It's uh, tinyurl, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com slash five, C is in cat, Q is in quiet, W, E is in, I don't know, uh, E and then, uh, I don't know any words with E in Elephant. Elephant. And then L is in Larry. And I highly recommend, if, this if that subject of abolition versus welfare interests you at all, I highly recommend this article. It's written by someone that most people would have thought would be an abolitionist and totally against welfare reforms. And I think that she does a great job of saying, um, we need to do what we can do to help animals. And in our ideology, our, our ideology should not, should only be part of it to the extent that it can help animals. Um, and, she, and she says it in a very eloquent way, much better than that. In 2003, the Outreach started our adopt college program. Basically, after I got done touring in 97, uh, we tried to get local activists to, to leaflet their local colleges, and we kind of, it kind of fell on deaf ears. We leafleted, I leafleted where I lived, and Matt leafleted where he lived, and we got a few other people to do it. But what I finally decided was we need a system to really show people all the colleges that aren't getting leafleted. And I hated to take a negative approach because for years we were like, hey, do it, it's great, everyone, get, you know, so many people become interested, and it just didn't happen. So I finally took the negative approach of saying, here's all the colleges in the country, and here's all the ones where no ve vegetarian advocacy has been done this year, and it's almost all of them. And that actually started to work. So we started, it became the first systematic attempt to reach large numbers of students. So we set up this website with all the colleges in the country listed on it. And now when someone leaflets, um, they report their numbers to us, and we go and stick the numbers under the college, the name of the college, and we keep track of, of what's been leafleted where. And it, when we first started it, was the first semester was fall of 2003, we handed out leaflets to 22,000 students. In the fall of 2004, it jumped to about 83,000. In the spring of 2005, 125,000. In the fall of 2006, 340,000. And by that point, we were getting to 385 schools. And then the fall, this was just this past semester, the fall of 2008, we made it to 684 schools and handed out 657,000 student uh, brochures. And um, so the total now is 2.9 million that we've leafleted since the fall of 2003. And so we're really happy with that progress. There's about 17 million people in school, at any, in college, at any given time. We actually do include high schools in this, but there's not that many high schools. It's a small percentage of the number. So now we're reaching, like, if you do the math, I guess it's maybe 2% of all college students. I just roughly did that very quickly. I, I'm not sure exactly, but it's 700,000 or 650,000 out of 17 million. So it's a good number. Um, we would like it to be significantly higher than that, though. We, don't, we, we hate to think that anyone graduates from college without getting a concise reason why they should be vegetarian and how animals are being treated. It would just, it's just a shame if someone leaves college without that. Uh, as, uh, and of course other, other people are doing some things uh, and I think what people used to think was that every college had a group doing stuff for themselves but what we learned very quickly was that it's really up to non-students to get to the colleges and reach them because they're really not, very few schools have groups that are, that are doing the outreach it, it, and there are maybe a hundred or maybe even two hundred but it's, a, it's still a small percentage of the schools and a lot of those groups don't do a whole lot throughout the year because they're just too busy with finals and parties and stuff like that. So, which I, I mean, that's just the way it is for college students. And um, so it's really up to us to reach them. Now I wanted to talk about some of our leafleters. Ashish Bimani, I like to talk about him because he never leaflets a huge amount. He'll go out for a half an hour to an hour. He'll hand out 80 to 100 leaflets. Um, for a while he was doing it maybe once a week, maybe once every other week. And after a few years, he's done 18,000, he's handed out 18,000 pamphlets. And it's not a huge deal for him. He, he doesn't, uh, you know, it, it's not a back-breaking work or anything, but it really adds up over time. Okay, Linda Bauer is a soccer mom in Florida. Literally, her kids go and play soccer, and she um, has still been able to hand out 23,000 pamphlets for us in, in, in the Miami area, which is awesome. So I just want to see that everyone can do it, and you never have to think, oh, I'm too old to do it. What will the college students think of me? It, it, does, it doesn't matter. They, they'll take a brochure from someone the, the, who's older. Don Ratcliffe, I like to bring her up because uh, she 
Last year in December, we had a pretty good end of the year fundraising season, which is usually the last two weeks of the whole year. And so we were able, I knew that she didn't, she was in between jobs. And so we said, Don, we have some funds. Would you like to tour around the South and leaflet until you can't anymore? And she said she could do it for a month. And she did. And she handed out 18,633 in one month. And I think that was, the, I'm pretty sure that was the record at the time. And it, well, I like to show this because if anyone is considering supporting vegan outreach, it kind of shows you if we get donations, we put them to work um, as soon as we can. Uh, John Bowers is in British Columbia in Canada, and he likes to leaflet in the snow. Um, 27,000 pamphlets. Fred Tyler is one of our uh, paid leafleters. He started last spring, and he's been very good and consistent. He has to leaflet in very cold weather, Minneapolis, and, the, and he tours around Minnesota and Wisconsin. And Iowa, it doesn't get warm there until May. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so he braves a lot of cold weather, and he's done 37,000 pamphlets for us since then. He's on a sabbatical for a couple months. We, we, um, our, our, the money didn't, wasn't coming in so well this year with, because of the economy and because of the cold. I said, you know, we talked to him and said, do you really want to do something in the cold? He said, actually, I was thinking the same thing. Maybe I'll take some time off till March so that, uh, but he'll be back at it again soon. Uh, in our audience, we have Brienne. Will you raise your hand? Yay. Yay. Just started for us last semester and has done 37,000 in Southern California. And it's great to have her. Eileen has been leafleting for us for years in New York City and she's up, done 59,000 about. Uh, she also has to endure very cold weather. Brian Groupie is our Bay Area leafleter. He's moved around. He, uh, we needed someone in Boston last year, and he up and moved from Sacramento, where he lived his entire life. No, I don't. I think he'd only been on the other side of Mississippi maybe once, and he moved to Boston and went uh, and leafleted in the extremely cold weather as well. But now we we needed someone back in the Bay Area, so he moved back, and he's glad to be back. <laughs> and he's been getting out there already this semester. Then um, Vic is. Uh, has set the, set the world on fire last semester. He handed out over 100,000 pamphlets last semester, and we did not think that that was even possible. The, the record before that was 54,000. And he really, uh, he, would, he would get to his school before the first class change, and many days I think he'd stay until the last class change. And uh, he's got the one day record. He handed out over 5,000 booklets at Penn State. Um, really amazing. Okay, Joe Espinosa is another guy who just keeps at it. The years go by, and he's always out there in Chicago. He is a volunteer, and um, he takes a day. He works on Saturday, so he can have one day off, a weekday off a week, so that he can go to a college. And he goes all over the Chicago area. He goes to Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, uh, and southern, or up into more southern Illinois. And he is has now 175,000 total pamphlets he's handed out since we started counting. He's actually been with us since the mid-90s, uh, or late 90s, I guess, and we before we stopped keeping track. Here's Casey Constable next to a uh, bunch of pamphlets we sent them for the work tour a few years ago. He and, his, and Eugene Hutoriansky, who I'll talk about in a second. And he also, he's got a full-time job, but he works at an airport, so he's able to work the night shift a lot so he can go leaflet during the day. And he'll go on a tour every once in a while through Louisiana and um, and other and Texas is so big he'll tour around Texas sometimes and so he's uh, done 235,000 pamphlets and also in our audience Stuart Solomon Stuart, 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 Stuart uh, before Stuart we had one person I think had leafleted a school in Southern California and handed about 20 flyers I think that's what the case was and. Uh, so we had nothing going on in, in the L.A. area, and it was before we really had any money. We, I think we had one paid leaf litter. And so Stewart came on the scene and decided, well, we, someone had to be doing it. And even though he has three kids, three dogs, and a full-time job as a school teacher, he you know, gets out there and um, then we considered that it was before Stewart and after Stewart because Stewart 
start leafleting at astounding numbers. We had expect, I kind of said this to a few people earlier, but I'm going to repeat it. Because um, we would, a good day of leafleting for us was about you know, 300, 400, 500 flowers was an amazing day of leafleting. But when Stuart came on the scene, he uh, added a zero to those numbers, and he was leafleting 2,000 a day on a, on a regular basis. And we just didn't even know it was possible to do that. Um, and so once he did that, all our leafleting numbers really went up just, I guess, through inspiration and knowing that it could be done. And it, before Vic handed out 5,000 at Penn State, Stewart had the one-day record of 4,750 at two schools. Mm -hmm. Eugene it doesn't get out to colleges much. He leaflets at the mall every, almost every single day, week and day. And over, over the many years he's been leafleting for us, he's handed out 334,000 pamphlets. And he is the second biggest leafleter in know, which is history. And here is John Camp, uh, who has handed out over 450,000 booklets. He's been leafleting with us since about when uh, Dr. College began. And we hired him in 2004, and he's our outreach, uh, director of outreach now. And uh, he may hold the Guinness World Record for handing out pamphlets to people. Mm -hmm. I don't know how there could be somebody who's done more than him. But um, anyway, I wanted to highlight those leafleters, and I don't think the numbers are, are that big of a deal. Anyone who goes out for an hour and hands out 50 to 100 pamphlets, you could reach a few people doing that that will go vegetarian. So um, anytime you feel like, you know, I just wish there were more vegetarians, just get some literature and go out and hand them out, and you're going to pot very likely, if, if it's at a college, create some more vegetarians than in there. I wanted to give some uh, kudos to Animal, United Animal Advocates of LA who get out on the, the Santa Monica Promenade with very uh, almost every weekend. And well, I wanted to thank uh, a, <coughs> a we also for bringing the screen, and he's with the and United Animal Advocates of LA, so you could talk to him or Almighty about getting involved with them. And they do it on the weekend, so if you have work during the week, uh, you can get out with them. Okay. And then also Animal Protection and Rescue League, leaflets in San Diego uh, with our materials, and they've been big supporters of Vegan Outreach over the years. And we have Kath Rogers here and Christina. And if you want to get involved, if you're like from that area, which I'm sure probably most of you aren't, but um, anyway, I wanted to point out that they were here and they've been doing a lot in San Diego. And their numbers are actually much higher than that, but sometimes they, they aren't reported. <laughs> it's okay. But I just wanted to say, they actually hand out, have handed out a lot more than that. Um, okay. So all in total, we've leafleted at 1,269 schools, many of those many, many times. Um, we've reached 2.9 million students. We estimate, and it's a very rough estimate, we have no way of knowing exactly, but uh, we estimate based on about a 2.5 percentage rate. Well, actually, I calculate a lot of things into it. We estimate about 72,000 new vegetarians. Um, and if that's the case, it would spare 2.5 million birds and mammals per year from factory farming and 120 million over 50 years if you assume your average college student is going to live another 50 years. Another thing that we're doing is we're changing attitudes. I feel like a lot of the groundwork we laid in California helped probably turn public opinion against factory farming for Prop 2 to pass. And vice versa, I think Prop 2 also helped a lot of people go vegetarian. In 2005, we developed a brochure called Even If You Like Meat, uh, You Can Help End This Cruelty. And at the bottom it says, if everyone just cut their meat consumption in half, billions of animals would be spared for, from suffering. And this was kind of a, a deviation from go vegan. but. Um, we felt like a lot of the p barrier to people trying vegetarianism was an all or nothing approach. They felt like, if I, first of all, they probably know a vegan now, uh, especially in, in the city parts of the country. They know a vegan who is, can't eat in a restaurant, can't do this, can't do that because of the animal products, and they don't even know why exactly, but it's just that there's animal products in there and they're vegan. So they, they think, when they're presented with why vegan, a lot of them think, okay, um, this is telling me to go vegan, so I have a choice between, if I care about this issue, I'm going to have to be like this person I know who's so uptight and can't do anything. <laughs> and since that's ridiculous, and there's no way someone should have to do that, I'm off the hook because it's an all or nothing thing. And I don't know exactly why they think it's an all or nothing thing, where, where that happens in their mind that things are all or nothing, but it is definitely something that is part of, seems to be part of human nature. Um, so we needed something we don't just want people to cut back half their meat consumption. Now, if everyone did that today, I would be very happy, but 
we, we want them to go vegan. But what this does is it gets it, they read it and they say, oh, this doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. I can maybe try this a little bit. And then it turns out that this works. So here is just one example of many, many, much feedback that we get. Someone wrote this about someone else. They wrote it to us in an email. Um, one guy, a very mainstream looking med school student, mentioned that he had been good friends with a vegetarian woman for a while, and she had given him her case for vegetarianism, showed him graphic images and such in the past. None of this convinced him. But about eight months ago, she gave him an Even If You Like Meat booklet, and he, for the first time, came to think that this might not have to be an all or nothing endeavor. He tried going a few days a week without meat, got used to this, and came to realize that there was no good reason he couldn't do this on a daily basis. He's now been vegetarian for about seven months. So, and that's, like I said, many people write us saying that. Um, now we have another brochure called Compassion Choices. It's a less graphic, even if you like meat, basically. And I like to use it for a non-student crowd who, are, who tend to be turned off more to graphic images, or maybe if I'm leafleting young kids where I don't want to upset them too much. Um, we also have our guide to cruelty for eating, and I have samples of all this literature over here, and please feel free to take some when the talk is over, and you can order it from us as well on our website at beingoutreach.org. Our guide to cruelty for eating is basically recipes, it's got some articles about nutrition, it's got uh, short articles about getting involved in promoting vegetarianism. Um, we give those generally to people who say they're already vegetarian, or that they're, th they're interested, we kind of give them a book like that, they're bigger than our other brochures. Okay, so we, we regularly receive advice that we should appeal to people's self-interest, the health and the environment. And it's amazing how many emails we get from people that don't think, I mean, it's funny, and I don't mean to make fun of them, but it is funny to get emails like this on a regular basis and to, for them to think that since 1993, this argument that we should try to appeal to people's self-interest hasn't, hasn't occurred to us. And that's kind of why I brought up all those brochures, uh, all those groups in the beginning. Who have, they've been, this has been tried. Trying to appeal to people's self-interest for this issue has been tried a lot. Uh, but one of the problems that I found with the three-pronged approach is, and that we as an organization found, and possibly as a movement have found, is that um, it's really hard to quantify a lot of the health and environmental argument in a, in a real concise, succinct way that's compelling, if you want to be as honest about it as you can. And, and not, not that, well, I'll just leave it at that. But in 1997, we were approached by academics, people who were like nutrition professionals and others involved in academia who study these subjects. And they were questioning the facts in our brochure, particularly the health and environmental facts. So we started to look, we decided what we had been doing up to that point was we were just taking stuff out of other books like Diet from America and Animal Factories and other books, though Animal Factories was fine for the most part. but. Um, just books like that that were popular in the movement. And we would put the facts in and we'd cite Diet from America. Or we, I, we may have even at the time cited what Diet from America had cited without actually looking it up, which to me seems bizarre now. But, but that's, how, that's how it was done for the most part. Um, and it didn't occur to us that there was anything wrong with doing that. We thought, oh, it's true, it's cited, we'll do the same. So we started looking up the original sources and it let us realize that you just can't trace the, trust the claims from a book or, our, book or article, even if it is cited because we would look these things up and we'd get an original source and it really wasn't saying what, what the book had said it was saying in some cases. And we found that even quotations of famous people, which how could you get wrong? I mean, they either said it or they didn't and there's probably proof that they said it if, if people are going around quoting them. But we had to throw out quotes from Einstein, Da Vinci, Edison, Lincoln. Um, don't don't <laughs> want a lot of salvageable, salvageable quotes in our pamphlets. Uh, from, in 1997, what we had then, we weren't able to salvage much from 97, basically. So, you know, I think there is an environmental argument for animal products being bad for the environment. I think there's a lot of subtleties to it. Um, and I think ch and chicken is often on par with a vegan diet in many of the analysis I've seen. So that's a negative because we really, if you're thinking about animal suffering, chickens are, are treated very poor, badly in, anim in animal, in factory farms. And you can eat so many more chickens than you can cows, and so if someone switches to cows for the environment, switches from cows to chickens for the environment, they are going to be killing a lot more animals. Uh, I think it's natural for people to go from eating meat to cutting out red meat to cutting out chicken. That's just how most people are going to go, and I don't know that there's a whole lot we can do about that. But it's but to actually kind of promote eating chicken as being better than beef, there's a there's a tough line there. Um, 
at least with the ethical argument, we in our brochures focus on chickens and, and instead of, in fact, some of our brochures don't even mention beef cows because we figure anyone who gives up chicken, they almost always give up red meat. So there's almost no need to make that argument uh, other than to get them on the path. But anyway, it's a complicated thing. Now, as far as the health argument goes, uh, being a meat eater versus a lacto-ovo vegetarian versus being vegan, there are positives and negatives about it. Uh, to sum up another one of my talks, and I think that a plant-based diet is better for many measurements, like cholesterol levels, but evidence to date shows people who eat moderate amounts of meat can be as healthy as vegans. That's what I, the research has shown to, up to this point. Um, then the question is, is a vegan diet natural? And this is a big problem with promoting veganism. There's a lot of people that don't want to eat a diet that they feel isn't natural, even though the diet that they're eating is not natural. No one is eating a natural diet in this day and age. But in any case, they feel like a vegan diet is even less natural than what they're... They probably think of their diet as natural for one thing, but um, they definitely think of a vegan diet as not. And I think that's a big problem with the environmental movement. They want to get back to the way things were. And that part of the way things were, they see it as humans were eating animals on farm, you know, farming or hunting, maybe. Um, in my opinion, I don't think a vegan diet is natural. A lack of vitamin B12 to, uh, indicates that it's not. That I have a much um, longer explanation of that than to just say, well, no B12, no, it's not. But to, because we're running out of time, I'm going to just leave it at that. I think that and the evidence is that until recently, until the recent vegan movement, humans have always eaten animal products for vitamin B12. Um, now this does not pro cause much of a problem for me. Uh, and I'm going to quote Tom Billings of BeyondVeg.com. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with BeyondVeg.com. Tom has not made a lot of friends in the vegetarian movement. Uh, he, it's basically an anti, well, it's a, it's a website that's somewhat critical of raw foodism. <coughs> Tom was a raw foodist for many years and he's now a lacto vegetarian. He, can, he, I think he tends toward, towards veganism. And I think he even tends towards being as raw as, as he thinks is, is reasonable to be. But he has a, this website, that, and he allowed, he's really examined these issues in depth, and he's been critical of a lot of the claims made by vegans and raw foodists. So he, does a, he wrote a huge article on, uh, de, trying to determine whether humans are, are herbivores or not, and he claim, decides that they're not. He concludes they're not. And he says, you really don't need the nationalist claim to be a vegan or a vegetarian. That's what vegan with an asterisk means, uh, vegan or vegetarian. That is moral, spiritual reasons alone are adequate to justify following a vegan diet, assuming that diet works for you, of course. Further, if the motivation for your diet is moral and or spiritual, then you will want the basis of your diet to be honest as well as compassionate. In that case, ditching the false myths of naturalness present no problems. Indeed, ditching false myths means that you are ditching a burden. Um, okay, so, and I, I Ever since I decide, I you know tend to agree with this, and ever since I've come to that conclusion, I don't have to get into arguments with them about whether our our you know our teeth are carnivorous teeth or not carnivorous teeth. I mean, I think there's an argument there to have had, and they're not you know they're obviously not canine. They're not like a tiger's teeth, but um, I don't you know that's not an issue for me. I just can talk to people about this is what reduces suffering, and if you want to know what the health is of vegetarians versus meat eaters. Um, then I happen, uh, I've done the research and I know what the research is, so I can talk to them about that as well. Um, and it doesn't matter to me whether humans are naturally herbivores or not. So vegan outreach is basically taking the one-pronged approach tactic. And we feel like when we look at the history of it and summarize what's worked and what hasn't and what's stuck with people, we feel like there's been just a lot more success showing young people graphic pictures of animals and convincing them that way. Um, and so that's you know, why we're sticking with it for now anyway. The two biggest reasons for, for going back to being vegetarian, as like I mentioned earlier, people didn't feel healthy. And so one of the you know, a solution is to follow reputable health advice and read veganhealth.org or we have an article, I have an article on the guide to for eating. So if you pay attention to what you're eating uh, and making sure you're getting all the nutrition you need, that will at least minimize anything like that. A lot of people obviously and I want to point it out, they'll feel much better when they go vegan. They, uh, their health takes a huge turn for the better um, because of the benefits of the vegan diet. So this is for a few people. Um, and then the other big reason, someone actually wrote a book looking at the reasons why people went back to eating meat. 
uh, and they concluded that one of the big reason, one, one of the big, main reasons people were saying was that they felt self-righteous when they were vegan or vegetarian. They felt they were better than everyone else because of it. So my opinion is to don't be self-righteous about being vegan or vegetarian, and you'll never have to use that as an excuse uh, to go back. And the, the funny thing is, they, the, a lot of these people then sound self-righteous about the fact that they've gone back to being so maybe, I think maybe they're just self-righteous. <laughs> um, okay, so quickly, and I'm almost done. You don't need, uh, here's the lessons I've learned over, and, and then many of us with vegan average have, feel we've learned over the years. You don't need to win an argument with the mediator. Um, it's not about an argument, it's about saying, don't you, do you care about this or not? And if you care, if you don't think animals should be treated like this, then here's something you can reasonably do. You can do what you think is reasonable to stop it. Disarm angry people by affirming their experience. Um, I, you know, I try not to get in arguments when I'm leafleting. I try to, if someone comes up to me, a lot of people see what I'm handing out and they come marching up very mad about it. Well, how dare you, you know, how dare you? And then they assume a bunch of things that I believe and I just try to figure out where they're coming from and try to find the common ground. It, and it seems to disarm their anger quite a bit. If you are vegan to prevent animal suffering, say it. The more people hear it, the sooner they'll accept it as legitimate. Um, it's a numbers game. Uh, I hate to be so cold about it, but it is, and more good can be done than being in college one hour a semester than working on many of the people you know for years. And that's a big frustration of a lot of vegans, is that you know they've been working on their family for years, and, and you know one person maybe has cut back on eating meat. And, and uh, so if, if that is getting you down, you can have a really good time handing out literature, especially at colleges, There's just, or high school concerts where a lot of high schools that students attend is another great place to leaflet, and that's, you know, in the evenings. Okay, be a positive example of what you can reasonably expect, reasonably expect from others. And this includes, and this is controversial, but eating apparently vegan foods when out with them. Um, I try, I don't quiz waitresses about if there's things and stuff that from the menu look vegan. Now, if it, clearly you can't tell. I mean, if there's something that you think might be cream, then I would ask the wait the, the wait staff, but I don't ask them to bring me the, the ingredients of the bread that they make to uh, to make sure there's no whey in it or something like that. So that that's where my where I come from. I don't want anyone to to look at what I'm doing and decide they're not going to try being vegetarian because they think it's too it's too difficult. 